Now it is a majestic pleasure to introduce to this speaker, uh, Professor Howard Francis. He's an accountancy scholar, and he is also an attorney with many years of experience analyzing university finances for the American Association of University Professors. Howard holds a PhD and MBA from the University of Chicago, a JD from Fordham University, and he is, and also he received a BA from University of Pennsylvania, I must add. He's professor of- Go Quakers. <laughs> Sorry, I had to get there. He's professor of accounting at Eastern Michigan University, where he served as president of the AAUP Collective Bargaining Chapter. And uh, uh, the title of his talk is Analysis of the Financial Situation of Miami University. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't think I'm going to need uh, a microphone. You guys can hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, my intention is I already sent this out to you guys. So you will have this presentation. Uh, what you guys do with it is up to you. Uh, but you could use it as you like. Uh, next, this thing is 105 slides long. Uh, if I went over all of that, we'd be here uh, longer than it would take to watch Young Frankenstein. Uh, but there's a lot going on here. And so my hope is that uh, you look at the data after we're done here today. And there's something you see, you want a question, all you got to do is email me. Uh, you don't have to go through anybody, just email me directly, I'm easy to find, uh, and I'll address it. And uh, I'm here to support you guys. Uh, I've been to this campus once before. When was that, Kathy? I don't remember when it was, but it was, uh, I think it was before that, but yeah, it was, yeah, whatever. It was a while back. Uh, I honestly can't remember, but I know it was, somewhere in the five to 10 year range again, that sounds about right. Maybe even longer, yeah. But certainly want to support you guys, done a lot of work here in Ohio. Uh, if you think about when we started, uh, you know, I, when I drive down from Michigan, come down 75, and of course, there's the big BGSU. Uh, and when we first started, they weren't organized either. And uh, look at them now and uh, the same, uh, hopefully it could happen here because there's nothing like working together to get uh, to get things done. So I am going to focus in the presentation on pictures. There's a lot of words that go with it, but let's just go to it. So as I start with some words, overall, uh, there's no doubt Miami's in very strong financial condition. Uh, they admit this themselves in their documents. Uh, solid reserves, cash flows, modest debt, State support, not great, but getting better. Uh, there are significant transparency issues here. Uh, I do this a lot. Uh, I have a full-time job, I'm a full-time teacher, just like all of you, but I do a lot of these and I can't, I can't even count how many times I've done these over the last 20 years, but uh, I'll be frank, Miami, the way they present their data on the website, they act like they're a small private university. That's the way the administration presents the data. I know what data is supposed to be publicly available at a public institution. It's not here, uh, which is really a problem. And it's something that collective bargaining fixes, in my estimation. We can't do anything if we don't have the information, uh, as I'll show you. The bond rating is really strong for a uh, public university this size at AA3. And that was, and that bond rating is, is, is current. The administration's gonna talk, there was a decline in auxiliary revenue, housing, dining, parking, athletics, student union due to the pandemic, but total revenues were stable. There's a lot of money coming from the feds and from the state as well. Uh, there's definitely is an issue with high admin costs. And we're gonna look at, and it differs by campus. We're gonna look at all three campuses here separately. And there's no doubt that your faculty salaries are below uh, it's not all about money, but I think at some level it's got to matter. It's it, it's got to matter that your faculty salaries are not where they are versus their peers. And remember, 
if you think I'm being like high, I work at a place like four levels below you guys. So uh, there's no, you know, there, there's no, oh, look where I am. Uh, we're unionized, but uh, and we're in the same conference as you. Eastern Michigan's in the same, we're, we're in the same conference as you. But uh, other than that, no. Well, that is a problem. No, it's already in PDF. This is already the PDF. They're not seeing it. There you go. Okay, sorry. Okay, so all these transparency issues, I'm not gonna go to all these links. A lot of you guys think I was doing the budget. I, I never do budgets. Budgets are plans and, but even if I wanted to do it, let's say I wanted to analyze the budget here at MU, which I would at some level, the most recent one on the website is 1920. Really? Really? I'm sure they may share with you some faculty committees. They may share budgets with you. And maybe if you have a, if you have a Miami OH EDU email, you could have access to it. But I don't think that's the case. Uh, so the Miami facts, they don't give enrollment. They give about how many students there are. Really? About? Could you just tell me how many students you have? Really? Fact book's no longer publicly available. Uh, the most recent enrollment data is from fall 20. Uh, most of the links at this office are not live. They don't work. And this is how peers do it. Toledo, fall 22 enrollment. It's November 17th. We should know fall enrollment now. And it should be publicly available for this fall. Uh, there's, no, there's just no two ways about it. And there's nothing started. And Cincinnati and Ohio are the same thing. So even if I wanted to do budgets, I'll just leave it like this. But the word starts with B and ends with S. That's all you got to know about budgets. Uh, we're, you don't learn about the financial situation of a place by looking at their budget. You look at what actually happened. And budget models, you hear about all these budget models. Well, they really want to do two things. They want to stop hiring tenured faculty, and they want to eliminate as many liberal arts programs as possible. Uh, they don't say that out loud, but that's what these budget models are for. Every Department supposed to act, you know, it's supposed to be self supporting. Every uh, department or college is supposed to uh, make their own money. Uh, so, I don't know. So, okay, let's look at the financials. So, this is the balance sheet. You don't, the second point I have here, it's not proper to make definitive conclusions from this broad data, but still, it's a nice balance sheet. Assets are up here, liabilities are down here, and in the middle are what's called debt assets. And we're going to look at how many how much reserves. Now there's a whole bunch of adjustments that are made uh, for pensions for, GASB is a government accounting standards board. The good thing about the state of Ohio is that the Ohio Board of Education does it all for us. As a, they do all the adjusting for us. So all we gotta do is go to the Ohio Board of Education's website and it's in pretty small font, but it's really easy to see. And so this comes from what they, they take the reported numbers, they adjust them because the pensions are not obligations of MU, they're obligations of the state of Ohio. So that's what the adjustments are for. In terms of the assets themselves, the orange are the buildings, the green are the in cash and investments, have nothing to do with the foundation. There's not a penny of foundation money in here. So you could, if you, it's hard to see that. Well, yeah, you guys can see it. That's $2.7 billion of assets, $1.2 billion of cash and investments, having nothing to do with the foundation. Doesn't mean they could spend all that, doesn't mean it's free, but it's nice to have cash and investments that are $1.2 billion that were under $900 million 2014. The reason I start, usually start these things in, in most of these places, in two, the analyses in 2014, that's the year when pensions and retiree health started to go on the books of these universities. And so that's usually, that's when we start the analysis in 2014, though obviously we could go back uh, further. And I mentioned before presentation about building first people. As I was walking around here, I know I, I asked a student, what was that, what's that construction? Like right, yeah, right there. And he said, it's a data and analytics building. Is that what you think? I think I'm an accounting professor. I have a CPA, I have no idea what analytics means. Uh, I don't know what it is. And they have a whole building for it, apparently. And then I was told the story of what's behind all that and even more discouraging. But anyway, so this is the change, the annual change in buildings and the annual change in the pay to all 
the employees, everyone, admin, staff, faculty, everybody. And you could see through 2019, a lot of new buildings, but the pay to faculty to everybody not going up so much. And then the reason why capital assets go down is if nothing new comes on board, the old ones just decline in value. Now this is gonna start going up again when that gets added in 22. Uh, that's gonna, and they have not, it, this is, there's a, there's a number here, it's like zero. So from 19 to 20, it was basically flat. And then $26 million less, they paid people in 21 than in 20. So that's not, that's, that's part of it. Now the foundation itself, totally separate. So the foundation itself has about three quarters of a billion dollars of assets and it spits off money. And in 2021, about $16 million from the foundation supported $600 million of expenses. So about two and a half percent of the expenses of Miami are supported by the foundation. That's pretty typical. That's pretty typical. There's nothing wrong with that. The one thing that bothers me here, gifts to foundation. How do you have a negative gift? I'm not so sure how that happens. Uh, I think what probably happened is someone gave a lot of money, they recorded a lot of revenue, and then the gift got changed, or the terms of the gift changed over time. And But they're not raising all that much money. I mean, you can see they raised 13 million, 17 million. The last couple of years, two and a half, five, not even a million, and close to nothing. So just leave it at that. Reserves. I'll just bore you. I'm not going to bore you the accounting. So this is the reserve. This does not mean that the president has $1 billion in a pot of cash sitting in their office they could use. It does mean, it does mean that they have significant financial freedom and flexibility to deal with unexpected events like a pandemic or declines in revenue that are unexpected. And we're going to put this in context. And the good news, of course, is that 2021 was the best year since 2014. And the reserves, the unrestricted part of the reserves keep going up. And the total, that's $900 million. Uh, it's the main reason why the bond ratings where it's at. And the other reason why reserves go up is because every year they take in more than they spend out, which we'll see. So the, the Ohio legislature uh, hired Moody's to do an assessment. Can we figure out when a university is not doing well? And so every public university, two year and four year, uh, gets a report every year based on these three ratios. And they each are weighted, you can see 50, 30, 20 adds to 100, and they give them a final score. And so this is what we got, five is perfect. And there's Miami for the last three years at four, seven. And this is the Ohio average of all the other four year publics, not the two year publics, just the four year publics. So in here, in 15 and 16, Miami was below the average of the publics, but since then, <laughs> things are looking pretty good. 4.7, it can't get much better than that. Why 4.7? Reserves are high, debt is low, they take in more than they spend. So pretty basic stuff. Res strong reserves, debt, low debt, and you take in more than you spend, that's why you get Miami's line up here. And this is, what I have here are all the publics for 20 and 21. So here's Miami, 4.7 both years. There's, can I say OSU? Am I allowed to say OSU here? Okay. Uh, I'm not a U of M fan. I, I teach at Eastern Michigan. We live in Ann Arbor really close to where they play, but, and we kind of, my wife went to Michigan State, so we don't exactly root for U of M, if you know the way that works. Don't, don't exactly root for them. Anyway, there's Ohio State. And you can see the others down here in the central state. And uh, Rudy, Rudy's not here, but if he were here, he would be shocked that Wright State's uh, score is now above four after being not so good for a while. And they went through a tough time at Wright State uh, in terms of we had, we had a strike that was, uh, we had a stand together. And they, they used this ratio, believe me, I was, we were there and certainly testified for them. This ratio was definitively used by the other side as, oh my God, you're in trouble. And it really wasn't the case. But Miami, this is nothing but, I, I just, 
I've been waiting to come here and tell you, show you guys this for a long time because they can't be crying poverty. That can't be part of what they're doing. Uh, it just doesn't. It just doesn't ring true. So this one of the ratios is the primary reserve ratio. How? What's your reserves compared to your operating expenses? And you can see this is the average for the Ohio Publix. And here's MU up, up, up. That's just nice. It's good. Viability is reserves compared to debt. Again, uh, nice. And net income, which is revenues minus expenses. They still see me? Because my. Are we still good? Okay. All right. That thing works. Okay. And again, red above the blue. All good. Uh, cash and investments, as reserves are going up, they have more cash. All good. And reserves versus debt, all good. Now, I think they, as Kathy told me, they, they borrowed some money recently for that analytics building. That will make the red line go up. Apparently, is I think that's the story you guys were telling me, that they had to borrow some of the money. For, and look, this, what's that? Half the money. That's probably $30, $40 million, you would imagine. It's not cheap. So, all right. Cash inflows versus cash outflows. I'll just show you the picture. Well, let me, I, I, let me go. Let me let go. We're, we're doing okay with time. Everything they bring in in cash, tuition, SSI, state chair of instruction, auxiliaries, housing, dining, student union, bookstore, non-capital grants. In Miami's financials, they don't have a separate line for the federal grants, the higher education emergency relief fund grants, the HERF grants. They combine them with the other grants, which is not the end of the world. I wish they would show them separately. They report them in a note separately, which we'll do, uh, but that's these grants going from 19 million to 49 million. That's the that's those federal grants that came that came your way. When you look at the total total in 745 million in 21, it did go down from 2020. But look at the cash outflows. The cash outflows also went down, and so the big cash outflows are paying everybody, payments to vendors, payments to scholarships interest payments, and then the total cash outflows. And so the green here is everything in versus everything out. 744, I'll type this in the chat, 744 million minus 676 million, that gets me the 68 million excess cash flows. That means they took in $68 million more in operating cash than they spent. And if you look at every year, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, every year is the same. Now it was lower this year, but still every year inflows bigger than outflows and not even close and not even close. And these are the operating cash flows, strong and positive every year. And it's, it's why their bond rating is where they're at. It's why the reserves are growing. It's why the cash and investments sitting in their accounts are growing. They're taking in more than they are spending. That is not an indictment on anybody. That's not a bad thing. It is a good thing that a university takes in more than it spends. But on the other hand, you start to ask the question, do you have to have, does it have to be like this? Does it have to be this much extra? Do they really need this much excess cash flow every year? Uh, yeah. So this is looking at things graphically. I like these graphs. We, you know, eight years is a long period of time. So you can see the tuition, and this is the cash coming in from tuition and fees. And you can see a slight, you see my cursor is a slight decline there. There's SSI. The, there's the drop in auxiliaries due to the pandemic right here. And, but then the cap grants kind of cover it. So the drop in the auxiliaries definitely happened. You can see it right here. But these kind of took, took care of most of it. And the only bad thing, and we'll get to this in a second when we look at the state of Ohio, this profile is not the profile of a public institution in many of the states we look at. Even in Michigan, this is a little higher. The, the state support is a little higher. Uh, in New York, in California, uh, in Alaska, Hawaii, New Mexico, these are all states that these two bars are close to each other in size. That this, what comes from the state is close to tuition. In a private university, this is zero, right? There's no state money. 
you guys are looking a little private-ish uh, in the way the revenue comes at you. Uh, maybe that's why the university acts that way when it comes to their data, because they figure, well, we don't get money from the state. Why, why we would bother, if the state gives more money, maybe we'd give more information. Out. I'm not saying they do that, but that's, that's So I think, as you guys think, what I, what I want to get across to you in this, I want, I want you guys just to understand what's going on at the place. They have money, but just to understand where the money is coming from and the degree to which, and what's happened over time. Now we don't, 22, the year ended in June. We don't have the 22 statements. That's not the fault of the Miami administration. The state of Ohio, because of the way they do the audits, they collect all the audits. Those are not gonna be available until March. But if you guys have me back in March, I'll be able to fill in 22. I have, you know, now that you guys know the way Excel works, just add a column, I mean, that's not that, it's not that hard. Uh, so it's easy to do. All right. Uh, Let's get right to the bond rating. So this is the bond rating, January 5th, 22. The affirmation of Miami's A A3 is reflects strong financial position. Not me saying it, Moody's saying it. And remember when the people who work here go to Moody's in New York, they're telling them how great everything is. And then Moody's makes their own assessment. Favorable student demand, effective management, oversight, and governments, which, the, which I, I mean, I put everything in here. I don't take anything out. Uh, the administration will say, yeah, some of the some of the reason we're doing well is because we manage the place so well. Well, I, I'm not. This is what Moody said: substantial absolute wealth. That means all that cash and investment, 1.6 billion dollars. That includes the foundation. That's a lot of money. Providing substantial operating flexibility. Not a place that has budget holes or is in trouble and has to make cuts. No, they already have all the money. They they could they have flexibility to do what they need. Continued strong operating performance. There is demand competition for students, but we expect steady student demand given its favorable academic reputation and brand. And you guys have something to do with that, obviously. St the stable outlook reflects continued steady enrollment, strong operating performance, despite continued pandemic related uncertainty and inflationary expense pressures. So if you thought everything I said for the first 10 minutes was complete garbage, well, now you have someone from the outside saying the same thing. So that's, that's the situation financially. Now let's look deeper. First, HERF money. In total, over there's three acts, CARES Act, HERF II, and then ARP, the American Rescue Plan, $68 million. $30 million had to go to students, $37 million discretionary. They also got right there. Does this thing work? Let me see if uh, my cat pointed. Uh, 15 million, roughly 15 million of money from the state of Ohio. Sure. That had nothing to do with any of these three X. So uh, that definitely helped. That definitely helped. I don't think it's hard to tell, but I don't think any of it leaked out into 22 and 23. The university will argue that this is all good, but it's one time, forget about it, never going to change. But what it did, what, it, what this money did was cover the reduction we saw in auxiliary revenue. And there were really no increased expenses when all, all, all said and done. That's why they did so well. Okay, SSI. I we do have this through 23 is the year we are in now. It's a fiscal year we're sitting in right now. So just to show you what happened, there's a two and a half. So from 22 to 23, Miami's getting two and a half million dollars more, a 3.2% increase. These are all the different components of state share, state share of instruction that the state uses to award how much each public institution gets. And over here, you can see the total SSI for Miami in 23 is $82 million. And the $82 million, I'm sorry, I hate to go backwards. I know you probably hate that. That you could see this is 100 million. The 82 million is right about there. You can see it's below the 100 million line. So, all right. So that's the HERF money. I mean, that's, just, that's the state, that's coming from the state. And there's, uh, here's the dollar changes in SSI. So if I went back to 2012, there was a governor here, you guys don't remember. This governor named John Kasich, I don't know if you guys remember him, he was governor here. Uh, as much as they even put him on MSNBC every now and again as the Republican loving, you know, that, that loves everybody. Uh, he did not do higher education any favors uh, a decade ago. You, I don't know if you guys remember that. 
uh, he was part of the same gut higher education mantra that Scott Walker in Wisconsin and uh, Rick Snyder in our state was part of. Uh, and the legacy still live, but still things are, things are getting better. And I think you elected a Republican governor for the next 100 years, apparently, from what happened last Tuesday. There'll never be another Democrat elected governor again. Inflation is hurting. SSI is nominally going up, but when you, we have a lot of inflation in our economy now. So, all right. This is administration and unions working together. We don't believe the state of Ohio should be 44th in higher education appropriation per capita. Uh, that's not a good number. Uh, hell, Michigan is, like, is 40th. I mean, come on. You guys can't beat us. Uh, it's not good. It's not good. And when you do, if you do it based on income, it's not much better. So the appropriation per, per person and per, it's just not where it needs to be in terms of total higher ed. And in terms of educational attainment, it's not, I'm not saying this is, the, this is the greatest metric in the world, but it is a metric that looks at higher ed spending, the percent of adults with a bachelor's degree or higher. And you can see there's Ohio toward the bottom, there's a US average, uh, there's a US average there. All right, enrollment. I was able to get enrollment numbers from different sources. Uh, IPEDS, I'm gonna put this because I use it so much. It's integrated post-secondary education system of the US Department sorry, of Education. And they have to give these they have to give data to the federal government every year. Unfortunately, we don't have the most up-to-date data, but this is okay in terms of enrollment. Uh, there's a bond website, the Electronic Municipal Market, EMM, that when you borrow money from the public, you have to tell the public what your financial statements are, and you also have to give them a whole bunch of other information. That's where I got the most up-to-date enrollment data from, was Miami's submission to the bond why is that data not on Miami's website? I do not understand why it's not. I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't make any sense to me. It's not like they don't have it. It's not a national security secret. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not getting it. But anyway, uh, and then the Ohio Board of Education collects enrollment. But I showed you already, this, the other institutions, the other publics in Ohio all report enrollment separately on their own website, but not MU. For whatever. And then now here it is by campus and number changes. So let's look, let's just look at some graphs. So total headcount enrollment definitely came down here a little bit here. By campus here, I'm, I'm putting Oxford and then the other two and then Hamilton and Middleton. Uh, I missed my W. I see that I got to get a W in there. Uh, that's, and we'll look at these. But they, they, these are not, not insignificant at all in terms of the overall, as we'll see. The change in headcount, you really see what happened in this year. But don't worry, there's some interesting stuff coming that I don't think you knew. I promise I, promise I have something to show you about enrollment that you didn't know. So, and that's good news right there. But enrollment generally has been uneven here in terms of its growth. Is that a fair way to put it? Some good years, some bad years. and. Uh, there's a lot to offer here. Uh, I, have, I have a slide on class size we may not get to. Your classes are not that big. You do not have, you guys teach fairly smaller classes. Is that a fair way to put it? Not really? It depends. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, I'll put it. Not a, I'll, I'll, yeah, that's a better way to put it. Not a lot of huge classes that we see at some public universities. Yeah, we don't have anything like that here. Yeah, okay, good. So. This is the percentage change in enrollment for all campuses. All right. And I like looking at this better because it looks at the different, over not just one, one year at a time, looks at three year periods, four year periods. So I got 14 to 18, 18 to 22, and 14 to 22. And you can see the two regional campuses very different than Oxford in terms of what happened in enrollment. But wait, there's still more coming. It's not just, it's not that simple a story. This is, the black is from 14 to 22. The blue is from 14 to 18. And the orangey 
is 18 to 22. You seem to be accepting more people who apply here. I'm not saying anything about that. I'm just saying, I'm reporting the numbers. You guys, may, I'm not saying anything about student quality. I work at Eastern Michigan. I'm not saying anything about student quality, but I don't see these kind of, except that's a big, in, a 20 point increase in acceptance rates in eight years. Uh, I don't know if you guys have noticed. Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, now you have something to now you see why. This is the one that really surprised me. And I want to just, just bear with me here on the international students. So a couple of different sources for this. CDS stands for the common data set. Common data set is required submission that gives us enrollment numbers. It tells us students by uh, race. It tells us how many students are in Ferrar sororities, fraternities, how many live on campus. It tells us class size. I could not find a common data set for Hamilton and Middleton. I could, they do have the most recent one for Oxford, which is where this comes from. And you could see the decline in international students. And then iPads also, you could see it matches, which I love when, I'm an accountant, of course I love when things match. Uh, look at when the data matches, I get so excited. And they matched here. These are the grad students. The common data set is undergrad only. And then in Hamilton and Middletown, we see not the same kind of thing, but we saw this huge decline here at Oxford. And this kind of tells a story. A lot of the enrollment decline recently was driven solely by international students. I don't know if that's something you're aware of, if that was intentional, if it was pandemic related. Uh, was it? Trump, you know, changing the rules on, on, on those sorts of things on visas and who could stay in, how long you could stay in the country and still be a student, those sorts of rules. So I just thought this was interesting. And then just let me show you the graph. So the long-term changes in international enrollment for all the campuses, you really see a lot of this, what's going, enrollment outside of international is actually doing very well. So, there you go. So this is all the publics in Ohio from fall 17 to fall 21. There's Miami right there. Not, well, let me get my cat pointer. Right there. So kind of central state, that's an anomaly because they went all the way almost to zero. Uh, there's UC. My last say UC. This is in. Okay. And, okay. That's it. All right. Tuition and fees. Discount rate. The discount rate it jumped a lot from 20, 22 is a very low discount rate for a public with $16,000 of tuition. Discount rate is the allowance for students scholarships over the sticker price. You know, you gotta get sticker prices, what people pay if they get no break. And so the 20, I, I define the 29.8%, it's this is my numerator, that's my denominator. The admin is going to claim that the rate is much higher. They tend to focus on the rate just for first year undergraduates only, but this is for all the students. This is for everyone, grad, because uh, it's all part of it. And it did go up significantly, but they also got a lot more money from the feds just for student scholarships. So that money did def definitively go towards helping students pay less. There's no doubt that happened. It'll be interesting to see what happens in 22. Does it revert back to, you can see it was 19 to 22 for seven years, and then it jumps up to almost 30. So what's gonna happen in 22? We don't know yet. It's a function of the, the sticker price, and I think it's a little higher though. Uh, as I'll show you on the last slide, you have a much, Oxford has a much smaller percentage of Pell Grant students in almost every peer that they have here. That's in there. Not the Ohio peers, but the peers that, as, I'll, as we'll define them here. So that's that's what my gut tells me. All right, uh, let's let's go, let's go to the expense side. Without getting too much into the weeds, we focus on salary. The expenses that they report on the financials are distorted. Distorted by what? Distorted. They estimate utility costs. They estimate retirement costs. They estimate 
Ohio SERS costs. They, all these things get estimated and the numbers we're looking at wind up being not very reliable. So we focus on the salary only. Salary, you can't mess with what people are getting paid. And if you want, you know, you talk about budget. If you want to know the priorities of a place, look at who is getting paid and how much they're getting paid. That's what we focus on here. Now, these, there are different categories of expenses that are standard that Miami uses everyone, uses. instruction, research, public service. And they were defined here. Again, you're gonna, institutional support is admiral. It's them. If I could use them versus us, it's all them. There's no union people at all in that category. Some of these other categories have mixtures of union and non-union people in it. Instruction is all us. Uh, deans aren't in here. The one thing that, that I don't like about iPads is the deans are in academic support along with the librarians. And any librarians here? That shouldn't happen. Uh, but you get mixed. And librarians, as you guys will learn when you're union, I'm not just saying it to be nicer to two of you. You'll learn when you get a union that the people that know what's going on in the, on this campus are the librarians. They just know everything because they hear everything. Uh, is that still, is that true here? You guys you kind of, yeah, yeah, so, all right. Okay, so first, uh, the expense distribution. So what I'm doing here, just bear with me. I'm saying, okay, in 2020, the last year we have data, by the way, I tried to get this data for 21. It was submitted to the federal government in 2021. Again, that's something, the 21 data was submitted to the feds in April of 22, I'm sorry, in April of 22. And so look at the year, the year. it's not because I don't want to get the most recent data. When you go to iPad's website, this is the most recent you're going to have. Right around when I get my Christmas presents, one of the Christmas presents I get, even though I'm not celebrating Christmas, uh, is the iPad's data comes out for 21. I'm, I'm like a kid in a candy store when that stuff comes out. Uh, but I can tell you, I just did a report for Youngstown State, which is a, a different union, if I'm allowed to say that. Uh, they were able to give it to me. UIC, I just did them last week. They were able to get me. Their union was able to get the 21 data, even though it's not publicly available on iPad site. They, the union just asked management, they give it to them because these are small PDF files that they have. Here, trying to get something like this out of the administration here, it would take an act of Congress, Senate, maybe even presidential approval. Uh, it, it, would be, it would be tough. So anyway, so... At Middletown, they spent $10 million in 20 on everybody. Everyone who works there got paid $10 million. Of that $10 million, $5.4 million went to the people who teach. $1.7 million went to admin. Is that high? So the 17% for admin is the $1.7 million over the $10.0 million in total salaries. That's high, as we'll show, we'll show you. That's very high. When you do that same, and is the 54 high? For a regional campus, it's low, but everything matters in college. So here's Hamilton. You can see they spent 67% of total salaries on instruction and admin is less than half of what it is at Middletown. I'm just reporting it. So here's Oxford, 49% and institutional support at 13. So, and then I put them all together. Could I, I'm, 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 not, I'm not messing over there. I just want to show you guys where this is all going with the peers. So just bear with me. I just want to, I want to, I don't want to miss this. So these are the peer institutions as chosen by your administration. One of the things that in collective bargaining we get to do is we have some say as to who our peers are. I don't know how you feel about this peer list on the left. And for Hamilton and Middletown, these are the peers that were chosen. They are basically the regional campuses in the state of Ohio. So I don't know how you guys feel. Uh, can we tell some dean and chair? Uh, they, they do not. The deans and the chair should, are not, they should not be in instruction. They're not supposed to be. And the instructions make clear that they're not. They're not. So I don't know how you guys feel about these peers. I analyzed them on various metrics. I looked at where they were. A lot of them, only four of them are in the same. BEA's, BEA is the Bureau of Economic Analysis. That region, those regions, sorry. And they're kind of arbitrary, but uh, there's some Great Lakes, but all over the country, everyone is public. 
don't take this the wrong way, but I'm still driving from Michigan to get here because you have like 75,000 stoplights when you get off the highway to get over, to get here. Don't again, don't take that the wrong way. I'm in New York. I'm allowed to say it like that as New York has had, but it says town fringe. I did not write this. This is not, and I did not just highlight it just to say you guys are from a small town. Uh, it says it right there. Does that say it? it classifies you? You guys know where you are here? I, I you guys get that. Yeah, town fringe. You don't make, you don't even make suburbs small. Yeah, William and Mary, so you, right, see that suburb? You, it's below, it's more, it's, it's smaller in depth. Yeah, there you go. Well, I, so town fringe, I don't think anyone else was town fringe on your list. Here. Town remote Mississippi. I've been there. I've, I've been to where, you know, Mississippi is. They actually, um, I, I wouldn't vote that way, but okay. That's what Ike Pitch came up with. I mean, Car Carnegie class of that class. Of that way. This is a Carnegie classification on research. And then do you have a hospital? Two of, the, two, of the, two of the institutions did have a hospital. You guys did not. In terms of enrollment, uh, in terms of tuition, you guys charge the third highest out of 16 in tuition for undergrad, seventh highest for grad. You're the 10th in terms of undergraduate enrollment, 14th for grad enrollment, and 12th for overall enrollment. So in general, compared to this peer group, you're more remote, you're less researchy, you charge higher prices, and you're, and you're somewhat small in terms of enrollment. I think the somewhat smaller is related to where, uh, seriousness, is to where you are physically located. I'm sorry, but that does matter. So this is, what this is, we're getting to the other point. This is the distribution of revenues to the peers. So here's, and this is Oxford, and there's 54% of your revenue comes from tuition and fees, the state 10, auxiliaries, housing, dining, student union, bookstore, and then everything else. And you can see you guys are first in the percent of your total revenues that come from tuition toward the bottom when it comes from state appropriation. For whatever reason, you've chosen peer groups that there's more state support than there is here in Ohio. Auxiliaries, you count on that more than any of these peers. You're more residential than almost everybody. You have more, a higher percentage of your students living on campus in your dorms than almost all your peers. That's what that's what's driving. It's not athletics, trust me. No one's going to your games. Don't don't take that the wrong way. Can we compare a slide. For local peers. I'll go back to that. I will. So I want to just the all others. You see Ohio State 59.9. That's all research grants and stuff like that and all the other mess that they do. I took out the hospital too, so it's not the hospital. Uh, but they do a lot of research at Ohio State, a lot of grants from the federal government. This is the one I wanted to get to, and then we'll go back to that one. So this is the expense side. So for Oxford, fifth out of 16 in instruction spending, last in research spending. When I add instruction and research, you guys are 13 out of 16, but third out of 16 when it comes to admin spending. So toward the bottom on core mission, toward the top on admin. I'm not casting aspersions, I'm just reporting the facts. You guys probably knew this implicitly. Now you know it explicitly. I said, you probably knew this implicitly. Now I'm showing to you explicitly. Uh, faculty salaries versus this peer group, almost every rank and all ranks are toward the bottom of this group in terms of faculty salary. For the regional campuses, this is the enrollment. You can see you guys are somewhat, the UC ones are much larger. And there's the two regionals for Miami. This is spending on instruction. Middletown at 54% is the lowest of this 21 group, uh, 21 institutions, regional Ohio, Ohio institutions in terms of spending. And Hamilton is toward the bottom as well. In terms of admin spending, Number one at Middletown in terms of the percentage of salaries spent on admin of all the regionals in the state of Ohio, there first. And uh, salaries, low mid. So let me go back. 
think it's crazy that you would uh, take in so much money in tuition and, and spend so little money on instruction. Like it doesn't make sense. That tuition is such a big part of it. And well, they would argue that there's other things that they're spending money on that the others don't have to do. And legitimately, it's residential, it's student services. Because so many students live on campus, you have to spend more money to, I just say, watch them. Uh, you want to keep them entertained, watch. I mean, I don't know what words you want to put in there. But in all seriousness, they're here. So you can't just let them, they're 18 to 21, you can't just let them, you know, well, you can, but you have to, someone has to watch them. Doesn't someone have to watch them? And you have to pay people to watch them. That's where the money, that's what they, and there is some legitimacy to that argument that they have more expenses in those other categories because they have to pay people to watch. Yes. No, absolutely not. Residence life and student services. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's not in there, but it would be, but my point is, Campus police would be institutional support. That would be. That would be. So your instinct is right there. But let me let me say this to follow up on what you just said. What I'm saying is they would argue, okay, we have high admin here, but they would argue the reason why there's not more money going into instruction is because we have to put some of that tuition money into watching the students make sure they don't uh don't, yeah, don't die, don't hurt each other. I mean all this, you know, just walking here from the hotel to here, there's cop cars everywhere. Why are this? I said to myself, are there fraternity parties at, at three o'clock on a, on a Thursday afternoon? Why are there so many? You're saying there are? Really? Thursday afternoons, these guys are having parties at three o'clock in the afternoon? <laughs> okay. okay. Well, I, I, I actually said to myself, why are there so many police cars that, you know, why are they, why, what are they doing? And they wouldn't have their lights on. They would just, you know, I'm like, what is this place? And so apparently there's a lot of parking enforcement. There you go. Okay. So this is slide 49 again uh, with the in-state. This is a different peer group. The reason I just chose this uh, slide just to, because I think what's going on in Ohio does matter, even though. I, I, I still think it's curious that in the peer group chosen by the administration, not a single Ohio institution is in it. I'm not buying that. I, I, I know you guys are in a, you know, you're in a different part of Ohio than most others, but I'm not buying that they shouldn't be a peer in the state of Ohio. And it's something that in collective bargaining, you guys should have some say about. Who should we be compared to? Uh, it matters who you compare to. It matters a lot. So, all right. So let me get back. Uh, so looking at from 16 to 20 in terms of dollars spent, admin salaries increased more than everybody else. Shocking. All right, let's talk about who teaches. I'm getting, I'm looking at the time and I'm very cognizant of the time. So who teaches uh, at all the campuses? It's a total full-time faculty part-time faculty and enrollment. So I was talking to Kathy beforehand about this, what's going on here. And there's no doubt that there was a big decline in full-time faculty uh, from 20 to 21. And you see it here. This is all the campuses uh, put together. And I'm not gonna bore you with the, the numbers. I just, let me, let me get to some graphs. So, Non-instructional employees, you, you asked me about other people who work here. All the campuses, people who are not faculty, management, librarians, academic affairs, business and financial ops, management, and then all these other categories. And the change in the number of employees, you could see a lot of the employee groups went down, but these groups uh, went up the most. Yeah, that outsourcing is a big, is, is the big thing in, in uh, academia these days. In terms of the dollars paid, the change in the dollars paid to all employees, all campuses, 
14 to 21. By the way, just I just want to show you the things I went over quickly. For those on the regional campuses, I do have here's Hamilton separately. Here is Middletown separately. All your all the employees and the dollars paid to them. So uh just wanted to let you know we have that. So this is the dollars paid, the change in the dollars paid for non-instructional employees. Management got the most increase, uh, which is not a surprise. And this is what's paid. I compared here all the full-time faculty versus management. And fairly close, more to, a little more to management in the last couple of years, but not horrible. Not horrible. All right. The average salaries of the non instructional employees. So I have all the three campuses here. The average admin is making 105 at Oxford, 104 at Hamilton, and only 78 at Middletown. Uh, there's just a lot of them. Uh, there's more of them, more people classified maybe in that direction is what they would say. But this gives you a sense of the pay of people. If you look at this graph here, you really see the compensation of people uh, who are not faculty. And you know, I'm, I'll just let you guys look at that for a second. You can make your own conclusions on what these numbers are. These are average salaries in 2021, not long ago. Not good. All right. So this is what happened at Oxford. This, all, this is the data sent, sent to AUP Compensation Survey. All of a sudden, there's, there's six categories, full, associate, assistant, instructor, instructor, lecturer, no rank. Generally, the last three categories are non-tenure track, full-time non-tenure track. The last category is generally, not always, generally visiting faculty. And look, so the, let's, go, let's go to the bottom one first. No rank goes from 147, 168, 160, 153, 133, 53, zero. Now, did that really happen or did they just change the way they categorized? Look what happened to instructor, 88, 41, 136. It's hard to know what this is. It's hard to know, is it real or is it just different people work in that office now and they gave different numbers? Yes. That would account for the, the yellow. They could be visiting tech typically. Yeah, and they, but they did let a lot of them go apparently. Yeah, so. Yeah, that, so you could see the other thing I want to point out, and we were talking about this earlier, the assistant professors are new faculty who are hired on the tenure track. That's, and you could see that category goes from 197 to 187 to 181 to 144. What happened is assistant professors get promoted. They, they don't, I mean, some leave, but a lot get promoted from assistant to associate, and full professors over time. I know we're old, but eventually we do leave. And sometimes we just die on the job. So we either die or leave, one or the other. And so, and associates become fools, but do they get replaced? And what I see in these numbers here at Oxford is some replacement, but not really a great deal of tenure track replacement. Is that about the way things are? Some, but not really strong. Yeah, okay. So. And so we did that. So let's look at, at Hamilton, similar story in the no rank, 15, nine, zero, smaller scale, but the same pattern that we saw in Oxford. The visiting faculty there were all either reclassified or let go, one or the other. If you look at the bottom row, look at the bottom row, unbelievably steady over the seven, six, seven year period. You find a different story though at Middletown. Look what happened to the number of faculty from six, 63 to 43. That may not sound like that. That's a huge change. That's a huge change. And it's not just the no rank. You can see every category of faculty went down from 20 to 21 on this regional campus. I don't know if people were laid off. Is anyone there gonna, from Middleton going to say anything? I 
and they're not classified as faculty anymore. From that can. So. So those are the kind of things that this, you know. Ho hopefully, you guys will pay attention to. So here, here are faculty salaries. Let's just show, show you some pictures. So, versus inflation, this is Oxford faculty salaries versus inflation. I have all the ranks here. I come. I have all the different ranks here, and I combine all the ranks in one. These are all full-time people. So I know there's a lot of discussion about who could be in what. The unit composition is a big issue that's still not settled. From my perspective, of course, it's easy for me to say, we want, I, I strongly advise you guys all to be in one, all the full-time people to be in, in one union. I understand that that's an issue that has to be resolved. Is that the way that Paul's at we're at? And it will be resolved one way or the other, uh, but I still believe it should be resolved given Given everything else that's gone on here in the state of Ohio, it should be resolved that you guys are one. And you can see overall, the all ranks did better than inflation in 16 to 19, but you're not keeping up with inflation now. And that's pretty common because inflation is unusually high. And at Hamilton, actually doing a little better than inflation. And at Middletown, not doing a similar pattern that we see at Oxford. So I talked about these peers already. See that? Moving right through that. Last thing, look at that. Go Red Hawks. I thought you guys had to change your name. How did you guys get away with not changing your name? What was it? It was something worse. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I've been in Eastern for 25 years and I've been going to games against my, okay, I don't remember, sorry. Uh, anyway, uh, athletic deficit every year. This may shock you that athletic department takes in about 10 million and spends about 30 and has a deficit of about 20 million a year. Does that sound about right? Does that sound something you guys are aware of, heard of? Uh, and it, if I did this chart for every school in the Mid-American Conference, it would look just like this. It wouldn't look any different. So you're not special, no offense. We're a little worse. Eastern, we're a little worse. We spend a little more for whatever reason, but not good. If I take, the administration will say, you know what? The scholarships are not really expenses. Those are just, we're just letting the kids in and we're not costing us any money. Okay, take out the scholarships. Look at the deficits that are being run annually just on a cash basis here, no estimated costs. It's not good. It's not good. Now, I'm a huge sports fan, as I was telling Kosiemba before. Uh, by the way, you guys got great organizers in Paul and David. I know them. So I'm just, I'm just saying, I've known, David, how long have we known each other, by the way? Oh, seven, oh eight, I don't know. Yeah, somewhere like that. So yeah, so you guys are in great hands there. But you know, every, every these deficits, no matter where you go, you're gonna find this stuff. You're gonna find these things. They are gonna say that this athletic program is the front porch. It is the window to the university. It gives us so much credibility. Mm -hmm. Just the fact that we're on ESPN on a Wednesday night in November and 17 people are watching. <laughs> Uh, don't, don't they play midweek in November on weeknights in, in the football? Next Tuesday, you guys are playing. Okay, there you go. Are they, is, it the, is the game here? Well, it's either they're here or there. It's either... Yeah, so there's some truth to that, that it does give some credit, but I, you guys tell me, you guys know your students better than me. Do your students come to Miami for the athletic programs? and to watch the teams play, uh, to watch the football team and the basketball team, I'm not so sure that's why students are coming here. I think for some students, and obviously the ones that play, it matters. I've always stated as a huge sports fan that the Mid-American Conference could play these sports at one fourth the price of what they spend. They do not need to pay football coaches three quarters of a million dollars, which is what they get paid now in that conference. They just don't need to do it. It's, it's just not necessary. And, Here's the thing that bothers me. 
the student fees, every student of every, when they pay a fee, a percentage of the fee goes to the Department of Athletics, whether they like it or not, whether they go to the games or not. I assume the students don't have to pay to go to the games. I assume they get in for free, right? But they're not really getting in for free. This money is coming out of their pockets, whether they go or not, whether they care or not. Now, that's fairly typical at MAC institutions. This is money coming from the core mission to support athletics because athletics can't support itself. Roughly 70% of the expenses are not covered by their own selves. And the reason is, look at this graph. The ticket sales were actually zero in 21. Now, they're going to blame the pandemic, which is true. But what were the ticket sales in the pre-pandemic years? I mean, look at that. No one goes to, people may go to their game, your games. No one's paying to go to your games. That's a fact. And it's, this is true throughout the Mid-American Conference. There is some money contributed. There is some TV money. There's some ancillary money in terms of novelties and, and uh, concessions and T-shirts. But the total direct revenues, uh-uh. This is, it has nothing to do with the pandemic. This had nothing to do with the pandemic. In fact, it was better in the pandemic year because their expenses went down and traveled. So it's, it just doesn't work. It's not working. And all right, last thing, the class size, we talked about that. I, you don't have that many big classes. That's what you was, someone was saying before. And you see that with the data. Uh, one year retention rate for the three campuses. That's some students who started fall 20, we're back in fall 21. That's a very high rate for Oxford. That's a, almost, that's a very high rate for a public institution. And it's much lower. I don't think graduation rates at regional campuses are relevant statistics at all. And I didn't report them here. They're just not, it's like, you know, we, I do a lot of work with community colleges. It's the same I issue there. It doesn't, it's not, a, it's just not relevant. It doesn't tell the story what's really happening. I think at a four-year campus, uh, yes, it does. So what I did here, this is me showing off my Excel skills. I have two different, see that, two different scales. Isn't that fancy? Unbelievable. That's the percentage of undergraduate with Pell Grants, and that's the six-year graduation rate. So Miami of the peer group of 16, sixth highest graduation rate, but 15th in percentage of students with Pell Grants. 12% of your students have Pell Grants right there, right? which is much lower than you can see than this group here. The, 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 the pinkish dots are all the Pell Grants. And the correlation, see that correlation? The more Pell Grants, lower the graduation rate. That's what that negative correlation is. Higher the Pell Grant, lower the graduation rate. But I'm ending on a good note. Last slide. People are graduating. You guys are getting people out of here. They love you. You're graduating them. It's going more, even though enrollment's been kind of, you guys, the graduations are good. These are, these are very good numbers uh, in, in all respects. Uh, in all the categories, the numbers are generally rising. Uh, someone must be painted. Someone must be doing something right here. So there you go. I'm done. Uh, how does that compare to peers? The grad rates, well, this, the grad rates peers is right here. How does it compare to, this is high. For a regional public, 81% is really high for graduation. Uh, Eastern, we're at about 41. We have more than twice our graduation. Our Pell rate's about 45%. There was a question in the chat about uh, whether the deficit was different under the deficit for athletics. It's only one number per Yeah, there's no, that's a good question. Uh, the athletic numbers, there are no, I don't have the athletic numbers from Hamilton and uh, Middletown. These NCAA reports, which the Ohio State Auditor collects, they only have them for, I don't have the, not those numbers for Oxford, the other campus, they just, uh, they're not gonna be as readily available. But we, we can look at some federal data there. Uh, I imagine the revenue there is close to zero at those campuses on the, on the revenue side, so it's just expense. But there, you probably have a larger percentage of the students who are athletes than here, if you know what I'm saying. Is it really food here? Is it good food? It's food. Yeah.
Yeah, I, I can't tell you how on point that is. I, my argument to that is, according to every administrator in the Midwest, there's six high school students left in the entire Great Lakes region, and we're all fighting over those six students. There are no students left who are in high school who want to, none, they've, they've all, they're all gone. When you look at, when you look at the enrollment, sorry, to, I, just want to, I just want to show you the enrollment numbers. I want to show you the enrollment numbers at here, you know, here, let me get to enrollment on a year by year basis. Boy, Lord, this is too long, I'll give you that. Uh, so I'm going to stay with numbers here. 23,000, 24,000, 239, 245, 244, 244, 240, 229, 230. There's no demographic cliff. If there is one, we don't we have not seen it at Miami for the last 10 years. We've been hearing that forever. We that's all we kept hearing. However, on the we rely very heavily on tuition argument. Yes. You are kind of on the heavy on the tuition side. You can see that versus the peers. You rely more. Uh, but on the other hand, there's more kids who are paying or to, uh, housing and dining, which are youth profit centers. Research is very low here, though, compared to peers. So we're a place, some of the peers have much more research, but have much fewer students living on campus. And the, you know, the room and board, I, I, just let me show you the room and board. Can I show you? Go ahead. Guys, how much it costs to go here? Just, just bear with me a second, okay? This is thirty-three thousand dollars. This is the year we're in now. Sticker price. Now everyone pays this, of course. Out of state, fifty-four thousand three seventeen tuition room and board. That is a lot of. I mean, maybe you guys have a fifty thousand dollar drawer at home, or a hundred thousand dollar drawer at home. That, by the way, is a line from uh, Albert Brooks in uh, Lost in America. In case you guys want to know, have you guys seen Lost in America with Albert Brooks? No one's seen Lost in America. We kick we him and Julie Haggerty throw it all away and yeah. Required viewing. Anyway, this is a lot of money. That's a lot of money to me. Look at the room and board numbers. 15,824. That's that's not nothing. I'm sorry, that's a lot of money to pay. And you have a, a higher percent. I actually collected the you have what is it roughly the percentage of students living on campus is just below half of all undergraduates, not first year, all undergraduates. And it's about 20% of the men are in fraternities and about 30% of the women are in sororities, which is very high for a public institution to have that kind of and those students are obviously most of them are living in your in, in campus housing. So those things matter. That helps defray some of the, we rely so heavily on tuition. But look at, I mean, to me, the enrollment numbers I just read off to you, we haven't seen it yet. Now, they would argue that uh, we work so hard to recruit, et cetera, but give yourselves a little credit, seriously. You guys must be doing something right with these students in the classroom, or else they wouldn't be telling their friends and neighbors and brothers and sisters to come to school here again. I bet you, a lot of you have had siblings and even children are some of the ones you had when you when they started right to have you guys had some of the the reason that is because they had a good experience here so someone's having a good experience here i mean it's not all gloom and doom someone someone is going to school here and liking it even if they have a party of thursday at three o'clock but they still like their i assume they still like their academic experience is that fair to say that they or you guys work them so hard that they need to drink on thursday at three o'clock I can't, I can't believe they're having parties at three o'clock on a Thursday. I just don't, I, I refuse to accept that. That's just not right. Anything else you guys got? Yeah. That's a good point. Okay, they, they, you know, that has, let me, let me, let me talk about that. That, that data, Okay, this is the data you're talking about. The acceptance rate going from 66 
up to 88. I think that's what you're referring to. And the number of applications is also going up. There was no data in the bond report on ACT or SAT scores or high school GPAs of the students. Often that data is there, but it wasn't there. You guys could tell me if it's, you guys know better than me whether you think this has manifested itself into taking in students that 10 years ago you would not have taken. The other thing is there's also the financial aid issue. You're giving a lot more aid than you used to, especially in these, especially now in the pandemic, as the pandemic, you got all that money from the feds and you're using it to get students in. Uh, the matriculation rate though, when you look at the matriculation rate down at the bottom, that is not changing. Uh, so it's hard to know who, well, hear me out. Yeah, you took in more people, but maybe the extra people you took in that aren't as great, maybe they didn't decide to come here anyway. You don't know that, but it's hard to know. Uh, you guys have been here for 10 years. A lot of you guys have been here this nine-year period. Are, are your grades any different? Do you grade differently? Uh, do you notice any different? You, only you know this. O only you as faculty know whether this makes a difference. I I'll say this to you. When I saw, I don't, I don't always put this in a presentation, but when I saw that, I thought I would put it in because I thought you guys would find it interesting, and obviously you do. I'm not trying to cast any aspersions on it. I'm just trying to report what I see. And I don't, you don't usually see that. Uh, you know, at Eastern Michigan, we don't have, they don't report that because the only criteria we have for admittance is breathing. And even that's option. Uh, so we don't have, we don't reject anybody. And that's really not a joke. That's the truth. We don't reject anyone who, who applies. That's because of this. They, they, that, they, there's a huge part of that ranking. Is this? Well, one one of the ways you can attract them more is if the people who work here have more say and more voice in what happens here then it will be even better for everyone. And how do you get more voice? It's called collective bargaining. That's how you get more voice. If I could, if I could be so blunt, I know I'm a bit of a union shill, but that's okay. I've been called worse. So, anything else you guys got? All right, let's eat. <laughs>